are overcomers. We have overcome. Satan is defeated. The battle has been won by blood and testimony. We have overcome. We'll fight until the death of us. We have overcome. By faith, we have conquered. We have overcome. We'll work the work till Jesus comes. We have overcome. The devil is a liar. We have overcome. His end is predetermined. We have overcome. Satan may harass you. Declare you've overcome. No weapon can form no prosper. You have overcome. Healing is in the name of Jesus. That seems elementary, but we're always going to make it clear that when we pray for people, we pray in the name of Jesus. Amen? It's in His name and it's for His glory. Uh, because there are a lot of principles and there's a lot of systems and medications and spirits and things out there that can either uh, heal you or at least bring an appearance of healing. But when we talk about the divine healing that's ours in Christ, we're talking about something completely different. Uh, we're not talking about just being physically healed, but we're talking about the whole person being made well. Amen? That Jesus, when He died for us, and when He took stripes for us, He did that so that our inner man could be cleaned, so that we could have a new spirit living within us, His spirit. And then He also did that so that our body could be sanctified and made whole. Amen? Made whole. Made complete. Uh, there are some things that, that, if you're not complete, just aren't as good. If I said to you, I got good news for you, I will put $10 million in your bank account today. Does that sound like good news? Okay, but here's the bad news. You've got to let me cut both your arms and legs off. Who wants the money? <laughs> I don't know about you, but I would rather keep my arms and legs than the $10 million. Because what good is $10 million if you can't enjoy it, right? You've got to be able to enjoy life. Jesus came to give us life and life that's abundant. Well, that's what's so blessed about Jesus is that as we abide in Him and as we trust in His name and His Word, He not only heals us, but He makes us whole. There really is a blessing of the Lord that maketh rich and adds no sorrow to it. Right? He's not just trying to trick you. He's not just trying to pull the wool over your eyes or give you something so He can take it back later. The blessing of the Lord is complete and we're made whole by it. But we always want to emphasize that that healing is in the name of Jesus. In Romans 3.27, it speaks of the law of faith. And we've talked a little bit on the law of faith. But faith is a law. And that law will sometimes work the principles of that law will sometimes work even apart from Christ. So we emphasize, again, the healing that we're speaking about, divine healing, is in the name of Jesus. Uh, the law of gravity will work, won't it? Whether I believe in it or not. It'll work. The law of aerodynamics will work, whether I know about it or not. Whether I know how it works, it will work. And the law of faith is also constantly at work within our lives. Now, when we couple the law of faith with the name of Jesus, and when our faith is in Jesus, rather than human potential or some kind of system, it, it's an altogether different paradigm. It's an altogether different thing that's happening when the law of faith is coupled with the name of Jesus. Now, that law of faith is always working in our lives. If I walk around today, and if all day long, if I say, oh, I don't feel good, my back hurts, my throat's sore, my hair's falling out. Now that may or may not be happening. You don't have to tell me. All right? But if I walk around confessing that all day long, then I'm going to reap a harvest of what I'm confessing. Now it doesn't mean you've got to lie about things. You see, it doesn't mean that if your arm's falling off, you have to lie about it. Acknowledge the problem. Acknowledge my arm hurts, my back hurts, I need help. All right, I'm depressed. Acknowledge it. But beyond acknowledging that, if you choose to focus on that or to dwell on that, the law of faith is going to work. And you're going to what you have faith for is what you're going to reap. If if you know if, if 
I'm always confessing my hair is falling out. And if I'm believing that in my heart, then my hair is going to fall out. So you acknowledge the problem. My hair is falling out. And then you get a good barber like Mary that can make it look like you got more hair than you think you have. <laughs> Amen? But you don't focus on that stuff. The law of faith is always at work. And I understand this. This is why it's not that I'm weak on sin because he who sins or teaches others to sin is least in the kingdom of God, is what the Word says. I'm not weak on sin, but I don't preach sin. I preach forgiveness. I preach deliverance, not bondage. If I stood up here every week and preached about the evils of adultery, and if you came here regularly, after a while, you would, many of you would be committing adultery. You say, no, no, well, look, take heed if you think you stand lest you fall. If I preached on the evils of alcoholism, you would be having issues with alcoholism. We talked a little bit about brainwashing, just touched on it in Sunday school. And in a sense, in church, our brains are being washed. Our brains are being washed. In a good way, I hope, right? With the Word of God, it says, it says to have your minds washed with the Word of God. In a sense, we are being brainwashed in this place today. <laughs> but we're being washed by the Word of God. But you see, the law of faith is always at work. So we don't want to focus on the alcoholism, the adultery, the sin. We want to focus on the deliverance. This works across the board, but the emphasis is on healing. So we're going to acknowledge the problem. We're going to acknowledge my back, I need something to change. But beyond that, what we're going to do is we're going to begin to digest faith. And we're going to begin to speak not what we see or what we feel or what our senses pick up. We're going to begin speaking the Word of God to that thing. And we're going to begin saying things like, by His stripes, I am healed. We're going to say things like, according to my faith, let it be done unto me. And Jesus, I believe that You can do it. We're going to say things like, praise God, my manifestation is coming and my back is healed and I've never felt better. And then in the most... The bet, to the best of our ability, we're going to live like that problem isn't there because we're going to live like we really believe it. To the best of our ability. Does that make sense to you? I'm not saying you should hurt yourself, but the law of faith is always at work. Now, th again, the law of faith works best when coupled with Jesus. I will be completely honest with you, there are other ways that you can get healed besides Jesus. He's the only way you can be saved and made whole. Remember, this is about wholeness, not just... Healing, because what good, is, what good is your body being in perfect health if your spirit's broken? If everything else is messed up on the inside? I mean, we, we come in contact with people every day that look good on the outside, but on the inside they're busted. Mm -hmm. What good is that? This is about being made whole. But you can get physical healing other ways. Obviously, a, you know, a good doctor, a good treatment. Nowadays, uh, nowadays there's, there's a uh, convergence or a coming together of the realm of science and the realm of spiritism. People are very scientific and they're very spiritual at the same time today. You really see it in school. And there's this, this merging happening, which I believe is, is part of the setup for the last days with the Antichrist and all that. And it says that He's going to work great signs and wonders and He's going to do all these incredible miracles and even the elect, if it were possible, would be deceived. Well, so let's, let's make sure that we're very clear about it. What we're talking about is in the name of Jesus. <laughs> It may seem elementary, but as elementary as it may seem, let's make it very clear, right? When we pray for people, uh, and when we, uh, when we remove sickness and sin and stuff from people, like a physician, let's make it very clear that we're doing it in the name and the power of Jesus. Uh, Delany's mom, as a child, grew up in Thailand, and she can tell stories of how the Buddhist priest would heal people. You say, well, pastor, how is that possible? I didn't know Buddhists could heal people. I got a theory. It's just a theory. I don't know. I haven't studied Buddhism. But my theory is that the devil would put a sickness on someone, and then the devil with that demonic sickness would be able to remove that spirit from them and make it look like the priest healed them. That's my theory. I don't know. I don't know how it all works. But there is this heightened spiritualism that is getting... Uh, it's already part of our culture. It's already here. You see it in school. It's all over the place. And there's also this scientific thing where we're doing all kinds of incredible scientific things. They say that uh, the military is very, very close. Maybe they're already there and we don't know it. Of being able to uh, have the pilots that can fly aircraft with the mind. Don't have to move a muscle. Just with the thought patterns and the mind. Who would have thought of such a thing? That you could sit in a cockpit and fly faster than the speed of sound. Sometimes many times faster than the speed of sound and control that whole contraption around you with your mind. Who would have thought of such a thing? I saw a, uh, 
I think it was through Verizon, but it was some, through some phone company, uh, cell phone company, that they were, they were boasting that, that their development department says that within the next five years, you'll be able to feel textures through your phone. I don't know how that's going to happen. It's going to have something to do with vibrations coming through your phone. So, you know, if you see a, uh, you're looking online at Lowe's and you see some carpet, and you're thinking, I wonder how that, I wonder how that feels. You'll be able to feel your cell phone and know how the carpet feels. Is that crazy or what? They say, now they say that's coming in the next five years. So we're living in this time where the realm of science and the realm of spiritism is merging. And I believe it is a setup for the last days and for the Antichrist. So we need to be very clear when we do things that we're doing it in the name of Jesus, right? And if you think it's elementary and if you think it makes sense, uh, just emphasize it again. It's in the name of Jesus. And when the Spirit moves... When the spirit moves, then some weird things happen. We play it really safe, and we just see every now and then a random thing. But when you go where the spirit's really moving, some weird things happen. And sometimes you're processing that, and you're saying, I, whew, that's, that's really out of my comfort zone. That's really out of my grid of understanding. And so immediately the question to ask is, is this, is this being done in the name of Jesus? Spiritism and science and all those advancements... I believe that one of the reasons that, that that's excelling is, again, people want to be like God. They want to do things apart from Jesus. See, there's a lot of stuff that sounds good out there, but there's only one way of salvation. It's Jesus, right? And if you get all the technology together and you get all everything else together, but you die without Jesus, you're still going to hell. Because He's the only way of salvation. God can unleash everything in us whether it be the, the healing, whether it be the prosperity, whatever it is. But here's the thing. To operate in the name of Jesus, you're making a commitment to abide in Him because you're using His name. So you're making a commitment to abide in Jesus. So we have the authority that we can heal the sick. We can cast out demons. We can even forgive sins, the Word says. But when we do that, we're doing it under the name and the authority of Jesus. God doesn't let you just drop His name. It comes through abiding. The more that we abide in Him means the more that we take on His characteristics. The more we take on His personality. Because Jesus says that if you want to use My name to its full power, then you're going to have to take on My personality to its full effect within your life. Paul said that. He said, you know, the Spirit of God, he said, the Spirit of God does really strange things in me. You know, that that, it's the Spirit that's at work within me. And he understood that some of that stuff was far out that was happening. Far out. You know, now we want to, and I'm not against it, I'm not saying I'm against it, but now we got, want a religious system, we want to say, you know, pray for prayer cloths, and we'll do that, we're not against that. But this was weird stuff in Paul's day. Those were sweat rags. Paul was wiping the sweat off of his brow, and casting them aside more than likely, and people were picking that up and getting healed by his sweat. How many of you think that if your sweat's healing people, probably you want people to know that it's in the name of Jesus? See, he didn't want another religion of Paul. He wanted it to be clear that it's in the name of Jesus this is happening. And there, the more that you will open up to God, the more of a move of the Spirit there is. We want to, we want to be a witness for Jesus. We want to outwardly just make it clear that healing is in the name of Jesus. This is what we're talking about. We're not talking about human potential or mind over matter. We're talking about authority and power to be made whole in your body, in your soul, and in your spirit by the authority of the name of Jesus. Now don't let it be said of us that the world has more to offer than we have to offer. We need to really learn to receive all that God has for us. Everything that we're willing to do under the mantle and the authority of Jesus, we can have. See, not the name without the mantle. Does that make sense to you? The authority of Jesus flows through the mantle of who He is. What we're saying is, Lord, if I'm going to do that in Your name, what I'm agreeing to is to allow You to do the work in me that it takes to make that possible so that You can receive the glory for it. But Acts 3.16 tells us that it was through faith in His name. And then Acts 4.10-13 says that it was uh, by faith in His name and there's no other name by which man can be saved or made whole. Now, I don't have the Scripture here, but I do want to point out that there were times when Jesus healed everybody, specifically with the lepers, 
and he healed them, and they were all healed, but only the man that came back to worship Jesus was made whole. Do you see the difference again? You see, there's healing, but then there's the being made whole. When we'll submit ourselves to the authority of Christ and the love of God working in us through the Spirit, we'll be made whole. That's, that's really where we want to be. Amen? And of course, 1 Peter 2.24 says that He Himself bore our sins in His own body on the tree, that having died to sin, we might live to righteousness, by whose stripes we were healed. So we make it very clear. It's in the name and in the authority of Jesus. Amen? Faith for healing comes by immersing ourselves in the Word of God. It's just the way it works. Jesus has some conditions. Now, it's not legalism. If, uh, if I said to Larry, I'm going to give you my wallet with my credit cards and my bank numbers and my social security card and everything, I'm going to give you my wallet. You can go and anything that you can know in your heart that I would genuinely do, you can do it in my name. That's a lot of authority, isn't it? But let me tell you, he better be doing what he thinks I would be doing. Right? And the Word warns us of that. It warns us of that. It says be careful that you don't get caught up in the dissipations and the drunkenness and all the things of the world. Because what we're doing is completely reflecting on Him. The, mo- the level that we're willing to submit to Him is the level of authority that He's willing to let flow through us. And so, if Larry had you know, all my bank cards and everything, and not just for today, but could freely throughout life go... And anything that I had the money to cover, anything I had the, the name recognition and the notoriety to take care of, if he could go and do that in my name, that would be a lot of power. A lot more power in Jesus' name, isn't it, than my name. I mean, because all authority in heaven and earth has been given to him. And all things have been put under his, under his feet except for God the Father who's not been put under his feet. But all things have been uh, put, in, put under his authority. So, our... Uh, Authority that we're talking about when it comes to the ability to heal the sick that Jesus gave us. If we want that, and really, again, this stuff applies to all things that are Christian. All things that are in His name. But uh, specifically, we're focusing on healing this morning. Uh, That authority comes through immersing ourselves in the Word of God. Now, Perry Stone has a real good teaching that I don't remember what it's called, but I'm sure you could find it. It's probably one of his... uh, more popular ones where he talks about the levels of authority and the levels of the Word of God. That, you know, there, there, are levels, there are levels to the Word of God. And the amount at which you're willing to dig in and dissect and digest and get that, again, is the amount of authority that you're going to have to work in. Because we're not working in our name, we're working in His name, right? It's His Word. And that's what gives us authority is that He said it so we can do it. Because He said it, we can do it. Now, uh, Romans 10.17, of course, says faith comes by hearing and hearing by the Word of God. The Word of God is a faith generator. Now, faith is already in us. It's not so much that we get a new kind of faith through the Word of God, but the Word of God is like uh, when we have faith in Jesus, the Word of God fertilizes that faith, waters that faith, feeds that faith, gives it the operating system on the inside of us so that that faith can grow and abound. Faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the Word of God. I take that serious. And I don't know how people make it. Maybe, I'll be a little self-effacing here right now, okay? Maybe it's just that I need a little more help than everybody else, All right, I'll admit it. Maybe I just need a little more help than everybody else. But through the course of a week, I listen to hours and hours and hours of the Word of God. And I know that I still struggle with thoughts. And at times with negativity and with unbelief. And I think, how do people live? How do Christian people live that aren't immersed in the Word of God? If I'm so immersed in it, it's my job to be immersed in it. Praise God for that. (laughs) Thank you, Jesus, for the heavenly calling. But if I'm so immersed into it and I still have to fight the fight of faith, then what must other people be going through? People that never open the Word. People that never... Look, we live in a day again where the spirit world and the, the, the scientific world are merging. It really is. If you're not a good reader, that's no excuse anymore. You've got CDs that you can listen to. 
If you don't got a CD player, you got cassette tapes you can listen to. If you don't have any of that because you're so high tech, it's all 100% free, streaming through the internet or downloaded onto your computer. We literally live in a day on our phones with earbuds in where we are literally without excuse. And I really take this serious. Now, I listen to other stuff and I read other stuff and, and audio is really my, my chosen way. I prefer to hear it. Though when I'm really studying it, I open it and I dissect it. But if faith comes by hearing and hearing by the Word of God, if the source of my strength is going to be through God's Word, and if I know that I'm going to want something in His name, then I'm going to want to go to the source of that strength. I mean, I really believe this stuff. I'm sorry. I'm brainwashed. I'm out of my mind. I've been convinced. There's not some uh, other religion that's going to come along and convince me otherwise. I'm, <laughs> I'm past that point. I'm brainwashed. I'm in this thing. There's no getting me out now. I believe this stuff. Amen? And if the source of my faith, and if the source of God's power working in me is the Word of God, then why wouldn't I want to be full of that? Why wouldn't I want to be immersed in that in every level? See, again, there are levels. There, there's the, the straight Word of God, and then there's uh, the preaching of the Word, which the Spirit reveals uh, so much that way. There is a uh, Jewish school of thought. Now, I'm going to be real careful with this because it gets real funky. There's a Jewish school of thought called the Kabbalah, which Madonna says she's a Kabbalist, but she's not talking about that. She's talking about Eastern mysticism. And the Kabbalah is basically they accept the first five books of the Pentateuch, the books of Moses, and certain other Old Testament scriptures. But it's a very, very old school of Jewish thought that Eastern, it's Eastern religions and Buddhism and a lot of other places have tapped into it because it, it, it's the kind of thing that revs their engine. And a lot of Kabbalists consider themselves not Jewish either just a, a completely separate religion. So you've got to be real careful with it. You know, a lot of them just think it's a completely separate religion. But the whole premise of the Kabbalah, Kabbalah which really the word... Uh, I'm probably pronouncing Hebrew worse than I'm pronouncing English. All right? but, but Kabbalah, really in the Hebrew, is just a word that means receipt. And I'm told that if you go to Israel today and if you go to the grocery store, you would ask for the Kabbalah and they would give you the receipt of your purchase. That's what the word means. Well, this was an entire Jewish school of thought which became very un-Jewish. And if you Google Kabbalah now, you're going to get Hinduism, Eastern mysticism, you're going to get Jews that don't believe in God, all kinds of stuff. But back at its roots, the whole premise of the thing was how to study God's Word in a way to receive it. Not simply to read it, but to really receive it in your inner man. Because how many of you know you can hear but not receive? <laughs> husband say amen right <laughs> say amen you love them but the wife can be talking but you're not hearing the kids can be talking but you're not hearing <laughs> Isabel you be good now don't get after Steve <laughs> alright see do you know that really nowhere in scripture are we told to read the word now we do read the word because it's part of studying and you can't study something if you don't read it but it doesn't tell us to read the Word. It tells us to study to show ourselves approved. We're nowhere told just to read the Word. There was some years back a big council on the English language where all the big wigs that teach English at Oxford and who knows where else, all these big universities, they got together and they said, let's, let's come up with the most beautiful poem that's ever been written in the English language. And what they selected was one of the Psalms. These were a bunch of even non-Christians, most of them. Just big council of the big wigs in the whole field of English literature. And they chose one of the Psalms as the best poem ever written in the English language. Like, you have to Google it to find out which Psalm that was. But this has been some, some years back. And that shows you that you can read something and not get it and not receive it. So don't go become a Kabbalist because most of that's occultic and everything nowadays, what they mean. And it's very legalistic because it's very Jewish because they got 120 steps that you go, go through to, you know, very, it's very, very Jewish in its origins. The legalism, you know, the law, all that stuff. But you go through the 120 steps, and then it, it would be equivalent. This is why the, 
the uh, New Agers like it. It would be equivalent to achieving nirvana, but it's just in a Jewish mindset of achieving nirvana. But here's the interesting thing about that. Again, the reason I bring that up is because it has to do with not just hearing the Word, but receiving the Word into your inner man, digesting it. And this entire sect of Judaism, that's what they were focused on was, let's see how we can go to the deepest level of God's Word and receive the deepest level of truth from God's Word into our inner man where we really get it. I mean, where we really get it. So, the premise of the thing in the beginning is good. It was just, just uh, twisted. Very, very, very twisted throughout the last several thousand years. But I drift. And now I've got to remember where I'm at. <laughs> okay. Praise God. So, gathering up faith involves listening, reading, and studying. Psalm 107, 20 says, his word, He sent His Word and it healed them and delivered them from their destructions. If God's Word is healing to me, if it's medicine to me, why wouldn't I want to dig into those Scriptures that I know to be healing Scriptures and get the deepest level of revelation that the Spirit will give me on that? Because there, there, there's when you just read something, there's when you hear something, there's when you can recite something, and then there's when you really caught something. You don't walk around saying, I understand the cold. No, you say, I caught a cold. Right? You can know all about a cold. Oh, you know, here's the germs that cause it. Here's the medicine you take to get rid of it. You, you know, you, you feed a cold, didn't it? And fast a fever, or am I backwards? Huh? Okay, starve a fever, feed a cold. That, I just eat all the time. I just say, eat, eat through them both, okay? That's what Janet's advice to me. She said, eat and sleep if you get sick. And that's good advice sometimes. That's what I do. But anyway, you know, you can understand all about, you can understand all about it. But you don't say, uh, I understand a cold. You say, I caught a cold. And really, when you've caught a cold, you don't really even need to tell anyone because they can hear you sneezing and coughing and wheezing. And, and you don't have to go around saying, I caught a cold. I caught a cold. Well, some people do if they like attention, but you don't have to do that. All right? Because you've received that, that foreign thing into your bloodstream, into your body, and it's infected you in a way that everybody around you can see. Let me tell you, when you really receive the Word of God, when you really believe that this Word really is healing to me, it's better than any cancer treatment, any aspirin, any... You know, whatever. And we're not against. Use what you got to use, okay? You know, we're not calling it an unclean. If it works, praise God. Just give Jesus glory for it. But when you really understand that this Word is medicine to us, and that if we'll immerse it in us, not where we can just simply read it or recite it, or that's all good, that's all part of the process, but when we can get down to those deeper levels where we've really received it into our system, that's when it'll really work. I've learned usually I don't tell people when I'm sick or when I'm not feeling well. I mean, Delaney lives with me, so she hears it some. But I, I don't usually say it back. But it used to be I would have to struggle. Oh, I'm so sick. I want to tell people I'm sick. I want to tell them that's why I'm acting funny. That's why I'm whatever. I'm sick. I'm sick. Well, I used to struggle with that, and my intention was right. But now most of the time, I'm at a place most of the time, not all the time, have grace with the pastor, all right? I'm at a place most of the time where if I wake up feeling sick, I'm so used to not telling anyone that I'm sick that it's probably three quarters of the way through the day or at night when I lay down and I realize, oh, I wasn't feeling good and I didn't tell anyone. It wasn't like I don't want to tell them, I don't want to tell them. It was just I didn't feel good, but I, you know, the Lord's my healer, the Word's my medicine, and I'm, <laughs> I'm just not going to focus on the problem. I'm going to focus on Jesus because guess what? I'm going to do what i got to do anyway. Now, if I thought I was contagious going to infect someone, then I wouldn't do that. I'm not going <laughs> so good to see you. <laughs> I you know I'm not stupid. I'm not going to infect someone on purpose. I'm not sick, by the way. But, but my whole point is, is that when you've really ingested it, when you've really ingested it, you're not trying to work the thing anymore. It's just naturally working. It's like a system of your body. It's a way of thinking. And it's a, it's a way of re, it's a rewiring of your mind, really. It's really a rewiring of your mind. It's the Spirit rewiring your mind and then manifesting in your body. Now, we're not saying you can't tell anyone for prayer or that you have to suffer through it or 
You know that if you're weak, because everyone's going to be weak sometimes, your faith doesn't stay always level. It'd be nice if it did, wouldn't it? If it was always level. But if Elijah you know, can call down fire one minute and a few hours later run and hide in a cave, I think if Elijah can struggle, we can probably struggle too, don't you think? And we're, we're like Elijah, we're told in James, and like nature of Elijah. But uh, the whole point is, is that when, when you've really ingested, ingested the thing, when it's become a part of who you are, you don't have to work so hard to apply it. You really see that with someone who has a skill. I actually was a little bit trained in carpentry masonry, even though I can hardly hit a nail. I remember when we would go, especially on, on the summer training, but when we would go to the, do a project or whatever, you had probably, you know, if there were ten of us, you probably had four or five guys that owned like a contracting business or something. And that's why they were just doing it, you know, to serve their country or whatever. Because you, weekend warrior thing. So, that, you know, they were like skilled in it, grew up doing it, whatever. And then you'd have the rest of us, you know, that we understood perhaps the book side of it or could do a little bit of it. But those guys, they wouldn't even think about it. You know, why are you doing what you're doing? There was not even a thought for them to explain to us what they're doing. And it wasn't that they were trying to be mean. It was just natural. If you've grown up doing it and you've been doing it and you have a business and you're doing it and you're doing it, the rest of us could be sitting here like this. Oh, wow, explain to me how to build that shed. And they can't process that. How do I ex- build it? How do I explain to you to build a shed? You just, you just do it. You just do it. It's easy. And you're like, well, it's not that easy. <laughs> right? You know, and they'll sit there and, and they just get in there and they're not, some of them are being rude, but a lot of them weren't being rude. They were just, it's just so natural to them. They can't help themselves. Okay, here's the project. Zip, 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 zip. Half the shed's built. <laughs> you know, we're sitting there. Interesting. Real interesting. <laughs> Because when it becomes a part of who you are, a part of your system, it's completely different. God's Word is the same way. We were designed to live on the Word of God. Man does not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. We were made for the Word. I mean, we're Word containers. That means that if we'll really digest and put it in our inner man, the understanding of the Word, at the deepest level that the Spirit will give us. And see, none of us have full revelation. No matter how much we think we have, there's always more. You just live at the level of your faith. You live at the level of revelation you have, and you're believing God that as you do that, He's going to move you on, because He who's faithful in little will be faithful in much. Uh, If I were to take and hold up a picture of a cow in front of you right now, even Silas could point and say, cow, cow, right? A toddler or, or just someone, even though that's a pretty good level of revelation that you can tell a cow from a dog, right? That happened pretty young in your life, I hope. But then if I were a dairy farmer, I would have a, when you say cow, I would have a whole different perspective of what cow means. And then if I were a veterinarian, even the dairy farmer doesn't understand the cow like the veterinarian does. You know, I work, it could be a dairy farmer, I work with cows all my life, but I just don't understand what's ailing this one. And the vet comes over, needs a shot of this, needs a little bit of that, and everything's fixed. Everything's all right. There are levels of revelation to the Word of God. And you don't have to feel small or feel little, because it only takes faith the size of a mustard seed, but when you'll immerse yourself in the Word of God, when you'll determine that this really is energy to me, food to me, healing to me. This really is uh, what I need. If you'll determine that and live like that, then what will happen is in time, that will become part of your fiber, part of who you are in that area. That's why it's possible for people to be really strong in a certain area, but really weak in another area. And you see that even in, in men and women of God, right? It's, it's great to stop and correct yourself, but really we're to come to the place where we don't even have to think about it. And that's when it's faith. When you're doing it and you aren't even thinking about it, and people are watching saying, wow, how did you do that? And you're thinking, well, that's easy. You don't understand that. That's really when you're at the place of faith. Does that make sense to you? Yeah. And that's the place that God wants to get us to. And that happens as we let Him enculturate us into His Word. But Romans 10.18, uh, again in that same passage, says, But I say, have they not heard? Yes, indeed, their sound has gone out to the whole earth and their word to the ends of the world. We're living in a time and in a place where there's no need for us 
to live out of God's plan and out of the full manifestation of His health in our body. Now, we will talk on one of these weeks about the testing of our faith and about how until our faith has been tested, it's really not faith. We'll come, remember, these are segments. We're going to have to put the whole thing together. But the Word has gone out. The Word is everywhere. It's within hearing of, of, of everybody. And your healing is as quick and as close as you are willing to trust the Word, digest the Word, and believe in the name of Jesus. But it's kind of like conception sometimes. But see, we would say, everyone in this place would say life begins at conception. From the minute that there was conception, that there was seed in that egg, from that minute, life began. Amen? Well, this is how the Word of God is. The Word of God is seed. We're told over and over and over that the Word of God is seed and that there's seed time and harvest. So if we're having a struggle in our faith, we're having a struggle you know, believing for something, we don't have to you know, just throw our faith away. We have to begin planting seed in our heart. And we have to realize that sometimes for that seed to come to fulfillment, there's going to be time because we're going to have to digest it. We're going to have to get it in the soil of our heart. But if we'll submit to God and if we'll let God uh, abide in us and if we'll abide in Him and if we'll take the Word of God seriously, if we'll do that and just digest that and let it become our nature and who we are, then we will reap a harvest. And according to Mark chapter 4, it says that sometimes that harvest will be 30, sometimes it'll be 60, sometimes it'll be 100. And I don't believe Jesus is putting limits on it. I think it can be a limitless harvest. Again, this applies to everything, but we're focusing primarily on healing. That if we'll take this Word of God, this is the most precious thing. <laughs> sometimes we take it and we receive it with weeping. But if we'll receive the Word of God, then we'll come in with our sheaves, won't we? We'll come in with our harvest if we just believe. Even up to... You know, a few hours before that baby's born, that baby can be aborted, that baby can be killed. Now, there's a security in God, but there's still a free will. The choice comes in, right? And we have, to, we have to, at some point, decide that this is the Word of God, this is bread, this is life to me, this is what I need more than food, more than money, more than anything else. I need this harvest of this seed that's in me. Because that life of God is in us as the Word is in us. And we need to be determined. That means when you get up, and your foot hurts, or your head hurts. And it's hard when you're not in these four walls, brothers and sisters, I understand it. But when you get up, you've got to decide this is the Word of God. I am not going to abort what God's given me. And I know God's forgiven us, and He's gracious, and all that. But that baby will be a lot better if we'll just make a decision that I'm going to get my harvest. I'm going to get my healing. God's Word is true. But I just want to read to you 1 Thessalonians 2.13 as we conclude. 1 Thessalonians 2.13 For this reason we also thank God without ceasing, because when you received the Word of God, which you heard from us, you welcomed it not as the Word of men, but as it is in truth the Word of God, which also effectively works in you who believe. You see, it's not just a good sermon on Sunday morning or a bad sermon on Sunday morning. Paul even said in another place, he said, I determined when I came to you not even to preach good. Because I didn't want your, your faith to rest on my human wisdom. Really, that's what he said in modern English. He said, I came to you and I preached real bad because I didn't want your faith to rest on me. He said, I want it to rest on the power of God. You see, the Word is the power of God alive in us. Brothers and sisters, you've received the Word. You've conceived something great into your being. If you'll just give birth to that thing, nothing will be impossible for you. Amen. <laughs> We are overcomers, we have overcome, Satan is defeated, the battle has been won, by blood and testimony, we have overcome, we'll fight until the death of us, we have overcome, by faith we have conquered, we have overcome, we'll work the work till we have overcome, the devil is a liar. We have overcome, his end is predetermined. We have overcome, Satan may harass you. Declare you've overcome, no weapon can form will prosper. You have overcome.